Hello, and welcome to the Hurricane Utah Adult Religion Class, sponsored by the Hurricane Utah North Stake of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. My name is Mike Parker, and I'm the instructor for the class. The Hurricane Utah Adult Religion Class meets on Thursday evenings between September and May to discuss the scriptures of the restored Church of Jesus Christ. If you live in or are visiting the Hurricane St. George area, I'd love to have you join us. Links to the class website are available in the show notes for this video. On the website, you can download my notes, which include footnotes documenting my sources, this PowerPoint slide presentation, and handouts that I distribute in class. Please note that this YouTube channel and the class website are not official sites of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Hurricane Utah North Stake, or any other church unit or department. I alone am responsible for these sites and the materials on them. If you enjoy this lesson, please feel free to subscribe to be notified when new content is posted to this channel. This lesson is going to be different than any other lesson in this course. I'm going to talk about the historicity, geography, and textual transmission of the Book of Mormon. These are probably the three most controversial subjects in Book of Mormon studies, so I'd like to lay some groundwork for the rest of the year by going through them in depth. In 1838, Joseph Smith recalled the evening of the 21st of September, 1823, 15 years earlier. He said, quote, while I was thus in the act of calling upon God, I discovered a light appearing in the room, which continued to increase until the room was lighter than at noonday, when immediately a personage appeared at my bedside standing in the air. He called me by name and said unto me that he was a messenger sent from the presence of God to me and that his name was Moroni, that God had a work for me to do. He said there was a book deposited, written upon gold plates, giving an account of the former inhabitants of this continent and the source from whence they sprang. He also said that the fullness of the everlasting gospel was contained in it as delivered by the Savior to the ancient inhabitants. Also that there were two stones and silver bows, and these stones fastened to a breastplate constituted what is called the urm and thummim, deposited with the plates, and the possession and use of these stones was what constituted seers in ancient or former times, and that God had prepared them for the purpose of translating the book. This single statement contains three important claims that we're going to examine in this lesson. First, the Book of Mormon is a history of ancient peoples written by ancient authors and Moroni himself was one of those authors. Second, these ancient people inhabited this continent and sprang from a specific source. Third, Joseph Smith was called by God to translate this ancient text into English. We'll first discuss the historicity of the Book of Mormon, or in other words, its historical authenticity. The Book of Mormon claims to be a historical record of an actual historical people, for nearly 200 years, its critics have argued that it is a fraud, a work conceived in the mind of Joseph Smith or one of his associates to delude his followers. Today, there is a new twist on that claim. There is a small but opinionated movement of people within the church who want us to drop all historical claims for the Book of Mormon and yet still regard it as scripture. They argue that the Book of Mormon does not need to be historical to inspire faith because the stories in it can be classified as inspired fiction, words given to Joseph Smith by inspiration, but not a historical account of actual people. There is, however, no logically coherent way to argue that the Book of Mormon is fictional, inspired or otherwise, and also explain Joseph's testimony of his encounters with the angel Moroni in 1823 and afterwards. Either Joseph Smith told the truth about being visited by a resurrected prophet from ancient America who told him the Book of Mormon was an account of the former inhabitants of this continent and that the everlasting gospel was delivered by the Savior to the ancient inhabitants of that continent, or he wasn't telling the truth. Likewise, if the Lord didn't intend for the Book of Mormon to be understood as a history of an actual people, why did he give Joseph Smith physical artifacts that were connected with the translation, the gold plates, 
the Nephite interpreters and so forth, and command him to show them to witnesses. Then Elder Dallin H. Oaks taught, quote, some who turn themselves believing Latter-day Saints are advocating that Latter-day Saints should abandon claims that the Book of Mormon is a historical record of the ancient peoples of the Americas. They are promoting the feasibility of reading and using the Book of Mormon as nothing more than a pious fiction with some valuable contents. These practitioners of so-called higher criticism raise the question of whether the Book of Mormon, which our prophets have put forward as the preeminent scripture of this dispensation, is fact or fable, history or just a story. I maintain that the issue of the historicity of the Book of Mormon is basically a difference between those who rely exclusively on scholarship and those who rely on a combination of scholarship, faith, and revelation. Those who rely exclusively on scholarship reject revelation and fulfill Nephi's prophecy that in the last days men shall teach with their learning and deny the Holy Ghost, which giveth utterance. The practitioners of that approach typically focus on a limited number of issues like geography, horses, angelic delivery, or 19th century language patterns. They ignore or gloss over the incredible complexity of the Book of Mormon record. Those who rely on scholarship, faith, and revelation are willing to look at the entire spectrum of issues, the content as well as the vocabulary, the revelation as well as the excavation. Unquote. Asserting that the Book of Mormon is historical does not mean, however, that every story contained in it should be taken literally or at face value. While the record itself is historical, it certainly contains hyperbole and passages that should be understood allegorically. For example, Nephi encouraged his brothers, quote, let us be faithful in keeping the commandments of the Lord, for behold, he is mightier than all the earth then why not mightier than Laban and his 50, yea, or even his tens of thousands?" Unquote. His statement about Laban commanding tens of thousands was obviously hyperbole, an extravagant figure of speech not intended to be taken literally. Another example might be found in the final battle between the Nephites and the Lamanites. Mormon listed 23 Nephite military commanders, each of whom led 10,000 men who were all slain. If we take that figure at face value, it would mean that 230,000 Nephites died in one battle, which would rank it among the deadliest battles in ancient world history. It's possible, however, that these numbers were exaggerated, as was frequently the case in ancient writings, or that they represented Nephite military divisions at full troop strength, while the actual number of fighting men in each division was fewer than that, near the end of the Nephite civilization. Examples of passages that were clearly not intended to be understood literally include Lehi's dream of the tree of life and Jacob's allegory of the olive tree, quoted from the prophet Zenos. Obviously, these didn't describe actual physical trees. These examples are exceptions to the rule, though. Examples of hyperbole and metaphors aside, if the Book of Mormon is true, then it must be a historical record. No other faith-based explanation can account for the many testimonies about its translation and the ancient artifacts connected with that translation. Next, we'll examine the geography of the Book of Mormon. If the Book of Mormon is an account of an actual historical people, then it follows that the events it describes took place in an actual geographical location. Before we can discuss where that location might have been, we need to first establish how the Book of Mormon itself describes the lands in which its people dwelled. The authors of the Book of Mormon made nearly 500 statements that described the lands in which the Nephites, Lamanites, and Jaredites lived. They did not have maps that illustrated their lands within the larger Western Hemisphere. Rather, they each had a mental picture of the layout of the lands with which they were personally acquainted, and they described the cities, rivers, wilderness areas, and other features in relationship to each other. John E. Clark, professor of anthropology at Brigham Young University, 
described the basic geographical layout of the Book of Mormon lands, based on the statements found within the text itself. Quote, During the days of Alma and General Moroni, Book of Mormon lands consisted of three sectors that could be considered Nephite, Lamanite, and former Jaredite. The depopulated Jaredite lands constituted the land northward. Nephite and Lamanite lands lay in the land southward. Nephite lands, known as the land of Zarahemla, were sandwiched between the ancient Jaredite lands to the north and the Lamanite land of Nephi to the south. A narrow neck of land divided the land northward and the land southward. Thus, Book of Mormon lands were shaped like an hourglass. The land southward was further divided into northern and southern sectors by a narrow strip of wilderness that ran from the East Sea to the West Sea. Nephites inhabited the lands north of this wilderness divide, and Lamanites controlled those to the south." Unquote. To Professor Clark's description, I add these other major features. The southernmost part of the land northward was called desolation by the Nephites, because there the Nephites discovered the bones and ruined cities of the Jaredites. It was also called Mulek, because Mulek, the ancestor of the people of Zarahemla, landed there. The land south was therefore called Lehi, because Lehi had landed there. The hill Cumorah was located in the land northward, near the eastern seashore. At this same hill, both the Jaredites and the Nephites fought their final battles before suffering defeat and extinction. The Nephite land bountiful was the gateway to the narrow neck of land and land northward. It was the northernmost part of the land southward. Mormon wrote that the land of Nephi and the land of Zarahemla, in other words, the entire land southward, were nearly surrounded by water, meaning these lands were almost entirely bounded on all sides by seas. The land of Nephi to the south was higher in elevation than the land of Zarahemla to the north. The Book of Mormon always describes people going from the land of Zarahemla up to the land of Nephi, or from the land of Nephi down to the land of Zarahemla. In the Book of Mormon, up and down do not refer to compass directions, they refer to elevation. The river Sidon was the major waterway in the land southward. Its headwaters were in the highlands in the narrow strip of wilderness between the lands of Zarahemla and Nephi. It flowed northward through the land of Zarahemla and emptied into the sea. The place where Lehi and his family landed, called the land of first inheritance, was on the west coast of the land of Nephi in the south. This is an example of an internal map of the Book of Mormon lands, one based entirely on descriptions within the text itself. So, armed with these descriptions of its geography and an internal map, have we been able to determine the location where the Book of Mormon took place? The answer so far is no. There is no revealed Book of Mormon geography. Joseph Smith never claimed that the locations of the events in the Book of Mormon had been revealed to him. He had personal beliefs on the matter, more on that in a moment, but being an inspired translator of the Book of Mormon did not automatically make him an expert in its geography. In 1890, George Q. Cannon, first counselor in the First Presidency, wrote in the church's magazine for youth, quote, the First Presidency have often been asked to prepare some suggestive map illustrative of Nephite geography, but we have never consented to do so, nor are we acquainted with any of the Twelve Apostles who would undertake such a task. The reason is that without further information, they are not prepared even to suggest the word of the Lord or the translation of other ancient records is required to clear up many points now so obscure that, as we have said, no two original investigators agree with regarding to them." Unquote. Speaking at General Conference in April 1929, President Anthony W. Ivins, first counselor in the First Presidency, explained, quote, there is a great deal of talk about the geography of the Book of Mormon, 
Where was the land of Zarahemla? Where was the city of Zarahemla? And other geographic matters. It does not make any difference to us. There has never been anything yet set forth that definitely settles that question. So the church says, we are just waiting until we discover the truth. We do not offer any definite solution." Unquote. The church's current and only position is that the events the Book of Mormon describes took place somewhere in the ancient Americas. Specific locations of its events have not yet been revealed. Even though the location of the Book of Mormon hasn't been revealed, there are many theories about where it took place. Since 1830, Latter-day Saints have suggested nearly 100 geographic models for Book of Mormon events. In addition to internal models, like the one we just considered, there are real-world models that can be broadly categorized as hemispheric geographic theories, or HGT, or limited geographic theories, LGT. Let's first consider hemispheric geographic theories. Joseph Smith and most other 19th century Latter-day Saints believe that the events and civilizations of the Book of Mormon were spread out across most of the North and South American continent. Some prominent early church leaders believed that Lehi's ship landed on the western coast of South America and that the lands of the Book of Mormon included Northwestern South America, Central America, and the Great Plains. In the hemispheric model, South America was the land southward, North America was the land northward, and the narrow neck of land was either the Isthmus of Panama or the Isthmus of Tehuantepec in southern Mexico. In 1842, while Joseph Smith served as editor of the church newspaper Times and Seasons in Nauvoo, the paper ran a series of articles about ancient ruins in Central America, declaring that the Nephites, quote, lived about the narrow neck of land, which now embraces Central America, with all the cities that can be found, unquote. And, quote, Central America, or Guatemala, is situated north of the Isthmus of Darien, or Panama, and once embraced several hundred miles of territory from north to south, the city of Zarahemla, burnt at the crucifixion of the Savior and rebuilt afterwards, stood upon this land." Unquote. Joseph also taught in 1844 that the whole of North and South America is Zion, not just Missouri and not just the United States. Turning now to limited geography theories. Beginning in the late 19th century, careful readers of the Book of Mormon began to make more rigorous examinations of its geographical statements. Through their studies, it became clear that the hemispheric view simply doesn't work. The Book of Mormon describes the travels of various individuals in meticulous detail, not in miles, but by stating it was so many days journey from one place to another. Based on the travel times described in the text, all of the action in the Book of Mormon took place in an area that was on the order of 500 miles long and over 200 miles wide, an area smaller than the modern state of California. A limited geographic theory proposes a confined real world geographic location for Book of Mormon events. There are many limited geography models. Most of them have been situated in one of three areas, Mesoamerica, the Great Lakes region, or an expanded version that includes the American Midwest, or Northern South America. Mesoamerica is the region around Southern Mexico and Northern Central America. Most limited geography models have centered on Mesoamerica, partly because of the statements about Zarahemla in the 1842 Times and Seasons articles, but also because the ancient civilizations in this area most closely match the Book of Mormon's description of advanced societies with sizable populations, cities, roads, written languages, warfare, and so forth. It also has the appropriate dimensions and land features, highlands in the south, lowlands in the north, all of it nearly surrounded by water. The Mesoamerican geography places the Hill Cumorah, where the final battles of the Jaredites and the Nephites took place, in southern Mexico, near the Gulf of Mexico. Supporters of the Mesoamerican model argue that the Book of Mormon's description of the Hill Cumorah doesn't match the features of the hill in New York 
where Joseph Smith received the gold plates. They claimed that early Latter-day Saints either believed the New York Hill was Cumorah because they misread the Book of Mormon, or because Moroni named the New York Hill Cumorah after the hill where his people perished. Great Lakes models are based on the assertion that the Hill Cumorah in the Book of Mormon must be the same hill where Joseph Smith received the gold plates from Moroni. The first Great Lakes limited Book of Mormon geography was developed in 1983. There are several variations of this model, but most of them identify the Nephite and Lamanite lands as being in western New York State and western Pennsylvania, with the narrow neck being the land between Lake Erie and Lake Ontario, where the Niagara River connects the two lakes. This would make Canada the land northward, where the Jaredites lived. One recent variation of the Great Lakes theory is the so-called Heartland geographic model. It retains the New York location of the Hill Cumorah, but claims that the events in the Book of Mormon took place across the American Midwest and the northern portion of the southern United States. Heartlanders claim the Nephite city of Zarahemla was in Iowa on the Mississippi River across from modern Nauvoo. This theory also asserts that Joseph Smith knew by revelation the locations of Book of Mormon events, and those events had to have taken place inside the boundaries of the present-day United States. Some individuals have argued for South America as the site of Book of Mormon lands, based on the statements of several early church leaders that Lehi's boat landed in northern Chile. To make South America work as the setting for the Book of Mormon, most of its proponents have asserted that the Amazon basin was underwater until the time of Christ's crucifixion. They claim that only the high altitude lands of the Andes Mountains were above water during Book of Mormon times, and these were the lands of the Jaredites, Nephites, and Lamanites. There are many other theories where the Book of Mormon took place, including Costa Rica and other places in Central America, Mexico's Baja California Peninsula, and even Africa and Malaysia. So what is the church's position on these various theories? In early 2019, the church published a Gospel Topics essay on Book of Mormon geography. It affirms the following five principles, and all these are quotes from the article. First, the church does not take a position on the specific geographic locations of Book of Mormon events in the ancient Americas. Second, the church's only position is that the events the Book of Mormon describes took place in the ancient Americas. Third, individuals may have their own opinions regarding Book of Mormon geography and other such matters about which the Lord has not spoken. Fourth, the First Presidency and Quorum of the Twelve Apostles urge leaders and members not to advocate those personal theories in any setting or manner that would imply either prophetic or church support for those theories. Fifth, all parties should strive to avoid contention on these matters. When we discuss Book of Mormon events during this course, I'm going to use the BYU Virtual Scriptures Book of Mormon Conceptual Map, an internal model developed at Brigham Young University. This map meets all the geographical criteria set forth in the text of the Book of Mormon without trying to connect the places to any specific external locations. A link to this map is on the webpage for tonight's lesson, and I'll include it in the show notes. Finally, let's discuss the transmission of the text of the Book of Mormon. How exactly did Joseph Smith translate the Book of Mormon, and how has that translated text been edited through the many publications of the book? We'll start by reviewing the translation process based on eyewitness descriptions. Joseph Smith used both the Nephite interpreters and a seer stone to translate the Book of Mormon. He could use either instrument, but he preferred the seer stone because it was more convenient. Both objects were later called Urm and Thummim. Joseph had no other papers, manuscripts, or books with him. Joseph placed his seer stone into a hat and drew the hat to his face to obscure the light. Approximately 20 to 30 words would miraculously appear to Joseph's view. 
Joseph would read off around 10 words at a time to his scribe. The scribe would write them and read back what he had written, likely after the 20 to 30 word view had all been written. If what the scribe had written was accurate, Joseph would say, correct, and the next set of words would appear to him. If there were errors in the transcription, Joseph would correct the scribe before moving to the next set of words. Joseph spelled out names the first time they were given, and later as needed. He did not spell out biblical names. Scribes misspelled each of the written names at least once later in the manuscripts. This process typically lasted about six hours per day, with breaks. When Joseph and his scribe resumed translating in the morning or after a break, Joseph would pick up exactly where he had left off. He did not need the scribe to read back to him the last sentence he had dictated. The translation process was visible to everyone in the room, including Joseph's scribe and anyone else who happened to be there. There was no curtain between Joseph and the scribe or anyone else, although Joseph did use a curtain to isolate himself while he was working alone at the beginning of the translation effort. The plates were not used directly in the translation process. They were wrapped up on a table nearby. Examples of church artwork showing Joseph translated by running his finger across an open set of plates make use of artistic license and are not historically accurate. The entire translation effort lasted from the spring of 1828 through June 1829. Most of the text was translated in less than 65 working days, between the 7th of April and the 30th of June, 1829, over eight of our printed pages per day. Joseph and his scribes produced two Book of Mormon manuscripts. The original manuscript was produced as Joseph dictated to his scribes. After the translation was completed, Oliver Cowdery made a handwritten copy of the original manuscript for use by the printer. This is called the printer's manuscript. In December 1841, Joseph placed the original manuscript in the cornerstone of the Nauvoo House. When it was removed in 1882, 41 years later, it had been badly damaged by mold and water seepage. Only 28% of the original manuscript exists today, much of it in small fragments of less than a page. Oliver Cowdery kept the printer's manuscript and gave it to David Whitmer in 1850. In 1903, Whitmer's grandson sold it to the reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, now called Community of Christ. In 2017, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints purchased the manuscript from the Community of Christ. It is now held at the Church History Library in Salt Lake City. The printer's manuscript is completely intact, except for a few lines that are missing from the bottoms of two pages. It is a precious resource that has recently been photographed and published in its entirety by the Joseph Smith Papers. As of 2023, there have been 24 major English editions of the Book of Mormon, 14 of which have been published by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints or its general authorities. The eight most important editions include the four editions published during Joseph Smith's lifetime, which are the 1830 first edition published by E.B. Grandin in Palmyra, New York, the 1837 second edition edited by Joseph Smith and published in Kirtland, Ohio, the 1840 third edition edited by Joseph Smith and published in Nauvoo, Illinois, and an edition published in 1841 in Liverpool, England, this edition was essentially a reprint of the 1837 edition. Also of note are these four editions published by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints after Joseph Smith's death. The 1879 edition, edited by Elder Orson Pratt and published in Liverpool, England. Elder Pratt divided the text into the shorter chapters we use today and also added verse numbers and some footnotes. The 1920 edition, edited by a committee headed by Elder James E. Talmadge and published by the church in Salt Lake City. This edition added double columns, chapter summaries, and new introductory materials and footnotes. 
1981 edition, published by a committee headed by members of the Quorum of the Twelve and published by the church in Salt Lake City. This edition added new introductory material, chapter summaries, and greatly expanded footnotes. And then the 2013 edition, published by the church in Salt Lake City. This revision to the 1981 edition fixed numerous errors in spelling and punctuation, changed the typeface of some introductory paragraphs to indicate that they are part of the scriptural text, and revised the chapter summaries and footnotes. In each of these editions, editors have made corrections and other changes to the scriptural text. Some of these changes were based on the original or printer's manuscripts, or other evidence that an earlier lost reading should be restored. Other changes were well-intended attempts to clear up difficult words and phrases. Some changes unintentionally introduced new errors into the text. Let's discuss a few examples of these changes. Some changes were due to errors in the printer's manuscript. For example, 1 Nephi 15.35, and there is a place prepared, yea, even that awful hell of which I have spoken, and the devil is the blank of it. The earliest version of this verse is from the original manuscript. The scribe, and we don't know who he was, so research just call him scribe two, wrote the word proprietor. When Oliver Cowdery created the printer's manuscript, he misunderstood the word and wrote preparator, a non-existent English word that probably means the same thing as preparer, a person who prepares something. This word was used in the 1831st edition of the Book of Mormon. When Joseph Smith prepared the 1837 Kirtland edition, he went over the printer's manuscript and wrote corrections on it. It appears that he struggled with what to do with this one. He first wrote father, and then he struck that out and wrote foundation. Foundation was printed in the 1837 edition and remained there until the 1981 edition. For the 1981 edition, the Church Scripture Committee changed the word back to Oliver Cowdery's preparator. This reading remains in the current 2013 edition. Based on the original manuscript, Royal Skousen, director of the Book of Mormon Critical Text Project, argues that the word dictated by Joseph Smith to scribe to was proprietor. A proprietor is an owner, the person who has the legal right or exclusive title to anything. The devil does not prepare hell. He owns it and manages it in much the same way that a person owns and runs a business. 1 Nephi 8:31, And he also saw other multitudes blank their way towards that great and spacious building. Another scribe for the original manuscript, and we can't identify him either, so we call him Scribe 3, wrote P-R-S-S-I-N-G, using an elongated S that looks like an F. This letter form had already fallen out of fashion in English by the time the Book of Mormon was being translated. Because Scribe 3's letter P looks like an F, Oliver Cowdery misread this word and wrote on the printer's manuscript, feeling their way towards that great and spacious building. That reading has been published in every edition of the Book of Mormon up through our current 2013 edition. This word, however, should be pressing. Not only does pressing match Scribe 3's handwriting, it also agrees with the descriptions of the other groups of people in Lehi's dream, all of whom were described as pressing. So from 1 Nephi chapter 8, verse 21, Lehi saw numberless concourses of people, many of whom were pressing forward that they might obtain the path which led under the tree. Verse 24, Lehi beheld others pressing forward, and they came forth and caught hold of the end of the rod of iron, and they did press forward through the mist of darkness, clinging to the rod of iron, even until they did come forth and partake of the fruit of the tree. Lehi saw other multitudes pressing forward. This is in verse 30. They came and caught hold of the end of the rod of iron, and they did press their way forward, continually holding fast to the rod of iron, until they came forth and fell down and partook of the fruit of the tree. 
in verse 31, those whom Lehi saw heading towards the great and spacious building were not feeling their way as if they were blindly stumbling. They were purposely pressing toward it, eager to obtain the worldly wealth and status that it promises. Alma 39.13, return unto them and acknowledge your faults and blank that wrong which ye have done. Alma's counsel to his wayward son Corianton was for him to return to the apostate Zoramites and confess his sins. Oliver Cowdery wrote repair on the original manuscript. However, an accidental drop of ink on the P and repair obscured the word. When Oliver made a copy of the original manuscript for the printer, he wrote retain, a reading that makes no sense, but ended up being used in every edition of the Book of Mormon for the next 90 years. When the Church Scripture Committee prepared the 1920 edition, the committee members knew that retain was incorrect, but they didn't know what the correct reading was, so they simply deleted it. Acknowledge your faults and that wrong which ye have done. That change remains in our current edition. The verse should read, acknowledge your faults and repair that wrong which ye have done. In addition to accidental changes to the text, there have been a number of intentional changes made by editors. Here are two early examples. Behold, the virgin whom thou seest is the blank after the manner of the flesh. That's 1 Nephi 11.18. This passage is from Nephi's vision of Mary, the mother of Jesus Christ. The original manuscript, the printer's manuscript, and the 1831st edition of the Book of Mormon all read, Mother of God, here. The virgin whom thou seest is the mother of God, after the manner of the flesh. For the 1837 Kirtland edition, Joseph Smith purposely changed this passage to read, Mother of the Son of God. Why did he make this change? He didn't explain his reasons, but one possible explanation is that he was reacting to critics of the Book of Mormon who claimed this phrase sounded something like a, what a Roman Catholic would say. First Nephi 20, verse 1. Hearken and hear this, O house of Jacob, who are called by the name of Israel, and are come forth out of the waters of Judah. Nephi was quoting Isaiah 48, verse 1. In the original manuscript, the printer's manuscript, and the 1830 and 1837 editions of the Book of Mormon, this reading is very close to the reading in the King James Bible. For the third edition of the Book of Mormon, published in 1840, Joseph Smith added the parenthetical phrase, or out of the waters of baptism, which explains what the waters of Judah refers to. There is no evidence that this phrase was part of the original text written by Nephi or the earliest text written by Isaiah. Rather, it was an interpretive insertion made by the prophet himself. The following year, 1841, members of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles published the Book of Mormon in England using the 1837 Kirtland edition as their base text. Because the 1837 edition did not have Joseph's parenthetical insertion, it was not included in the 1841 British edition. The 1841 edition became the base text for church published editions of the Book of Mormon thereafter. And so Joseph's insertion, along with other changes he made to the 1840 edition, was lost in later editions. The scripture committee that prepared the 1920 edition restored Joseph's added phrase, but they did not include the parentheses that were in the 1840 edition. This is how the Book of Mormon has read in every edition since that time. Be aware that even though that phrase is not in parentheses in our Book of Mormon, it is in fact a later edition that should perhaps be moved to a footnote. These are only a few prominent examples of errors and deliberate changes made to the text of the Book of Mormon. There have been numerous other minor changes to the text since 1830. Some have been found and corrected in later printed editions. Others have been found, but not yet corrected. And I'm sure that still others are yet to be found or will never be found. None of these changes affect the core doctrines of the Book of Mormon. 
it teaches the doctrine of Christ with a purity and plainness unmatched by any other book. That message has remained uncorrupted since 1830. That's it for this lesson. If you enjoyed it, please click the thumbs up button to give it a like and leave a comment below. Please subscribe if you'd like to be notified when new lessons are posted to this channel and visit www.huarc.org to download the notes, slideshow, and handout for this lesson. Next week, we'll begin our study of the text of the Book of Mormon by reviewing and discussing Lehi's first vision and Nephi's recovery of the brass plates. The reading for that lesson is 1 Nephi chapters 1 through 7 and chapter 9. Thanks again for joining me.